a Ratio Marketing Podcast. Have you ever wished you had a healthcare provider on speed dial? Someone you could call to validate your product market fit. Someone to listen and help you see your solution differently. Welcome to Healthcare Market Matrix, a podcast to help you see your market clearly. We dive deep into the challenges faced by healthcare organization leaders that technology has the chance to help them solve. It's all about gaining the kind of understanding you need to effectively connect with your market. Join us as we explore the healthcare market matrix. Okay, so we are back with an all new episode of Applied Theory Series, uh, which is a video series where ratio team members take the hot seat to share insights and strategies for executive teams and uh, their marketing departments. And today we are going to be talking all about RevOps, um, customer success, and ultimately how those two elements inform the ROI of companies' marketing strategies. And I'm really excited to have one of our co-founders and president of Ratio on the show with us today, Peter Smith, as he is the uh, master of operational and financial functions at Ratio and certainly has worked with many clients over the last 12 years in helping to craft KPIs and corresponding budgets to meet those marketing goals. So thanks for being here, Peter. Yeah, excited to be here. Excited to talk about marketing KPIs, RevOps. This is a, a conversation that always comes up with prospects and clients. So it's a, um, it's a fun one to talk through. Yeah, for sure. Um, so before we dive in, I'd love for you to share with our listeners a little bit about your personal journey into launching Ratio and uh, working with enterprise SaaS companies as a finance guy. What inspired you to want to be with a bunch of creative people? <laughs> yes, great question. Well, um, I, yeah. I would say I would say a combination of ignorance and excitement uh, excitement around it. So we um, so we started this organization somewhere around twelve years ago. Um, at the time, I was uh, I was in undergrad. I was uh, getting a business degree with a focus in entrepreneurship. Um, and uh, from a personal standpoint, I've always had um, I've always had interest in finance numbers. Um, really enjoyed my finance classes, accounting classes. So um, whenever um, whenever the three of us got together and kind of started talking about starting um, starting this organization, uh, I was really the business generalist, uh, doing a little bit of everything. So account management, project management, uh, all the financial management. And fortunately, over the years, got to gravitate a little more towards my my more natural skills. But what it's what it's really afforded me the opportunity wearing so many different roles is really getting to understand the um, the seat from our of our clients. Um, in that, you know, ultimately, these are healthcare technology companies that are um, from very different types of companies. So whether from a product offering to how they're formed. Some of these companies are self-funded, been in business 15 years and are at some inflection point where the traditional sales model just isn't working anymore and they're needing to turn up sales um, or marketing. Whereas others, you know, they're heavily funded in a series D and uh, it's really about scaling the department and gaining additional market traction. So it's been, it's been fun for me kind of starting out uh, as a business generalist, uh, kind of working in, you know, today kind of working with our team, uh, working, I, I assist in the sales process, talking to these prospects, understanding, and our, as an organization, we, you know, from 2011 to now, 2011, we really started as a creative agency, and now we really are a strategic growth marketing agency that has a lot of data-driven KPIs. So that's... Um, Honestly, over the years, we've gravitated a little bit more towards what I understand, um, which has been nice. I think uh, early on being- you finally feel understood. <laughs> yes, a, li a little bit more. Early on as a creative agency, I frankly had less to contribute uh, um, in that realm. But when we're talking about ROI and leads and you know conversion funnels, that's, that's a lot more math. And it's um, really what, I mean, what I like is the convergence of the art and science of it. Um, that's, uh, you know, why did I do this? Well, part of it is I like being around creatives and I like being around data people and I like seeing them interact and kind of come together to have kind of a shared, a shared goal and function. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's been a fun evolution to watch from afar and now be a part of as well. So it's, uh, this is an exciting chapter for sure. 
And on that note, I do want to talk about, you know, customer success and how marketing funnel fuels RevOps. Um, so you've spent a lot of time, as you just mentioned, scoping marketing budgets for the clients that we serve, uh, helping teams allocate, allocate uh, funds to support, you know, teams' KPIs. And I think this probably goes without saying, but most especially in the B2B world, and I know we see this too, uh, marketing is often an underappreciated function. Um, and I think there are a variety of reasons we see this happen with companies at different growth stages. Um, but why do companies seem to underinvest, sometimes even underpay uh, for talent, and ultimately underappreciate the time and results generated by those functions? Like, what are your hypotheses around that? Yes, I have a lot of thoughts about this one. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so I'll first say I'm, um, I'm optimistic that that, that equation is changing a bit. Um, I, I think a lot of companies are shifting and putting a little more focus towards marketing. But I, I think if we're looking at origin, why, and I, I do still think it's a trend. Um, I think, you know, if we look at healthcare in particular, it is, um, while it's huge and it touches all of us in some way, it is, um, it is very much a tight-knit community. And a lot of these people have been, uh, you know, once you start working in healthcare, you tend to continue working in healthcare. And um, with that, whether it's in your same organization or moving to another's, there, there's just a lot of community that happens. So I think traditionally, traditionally it's been a lot of direct sales. Um, it, it's been a lot of networking. It's a, been a lot of talking to people. It's been a lot of like, oh, well, I, I know this person. Let me reach out to them. Let me talk to them. And um, it's you know, it is effective. <laughs> like that, that's a very important part of sales and of healthcare. Um, but I think as the as the market has grown and gotten more complicated and noisier, that's become more and more difficult to, to strictly lean on sales and let that be the primary driver of revenue. Or at, even if you're, let's even assume absolute success, at some point you're just gonna, you're, you're gonna tap out those relationships. There's only so many of those or so much networking you can do. Or it becomes a bottleneck to the organization. Like so sometimes you can't scale the people on the sales function fast enough to where there's one person, they're the primary person, they need to touch every deal that's coming in. And that's just not, that's a bottleneck to, sit, to sales. It's kind of a ceiling on it. Right. So I think, I think some of the, the historical it's worked uh, has played some part of this, but I do think, um, I do think that's changed a lot. Um, another contributing factor is it's attribution. Um, you know, sometimes sales, pure sales is a little bit easier. It's like, hey, I met this person at Hims. We started a conversation and six months later they inked the deal. You know, it was a long process, but like sales did it. Um, yeah. Marketing doesn't always have the luxury of doing that, but it's, it's very important. So um, in marketing, there's just, there's a lot of different touch points. Brand awareness is a really big one. Uh, brand awareness is really important. People hearing about you, knowing about you. We, um, oh, a, a, kind of a fun story on our side. We, uh, we actually recently got a lead through our website. So if you just have, you know, strict, uh, you know, strict attribution models, that's going to be a web lead. Well, when we got on the call and started talking to them, um, it was a combination of, we had a, we had kind of a small booth set up at Hims um, several years ago. The, uh, an individual saw that and has since become a CEO at another organization and is now the right fit, the right time, and asked their marketing person to reach out to us and talk about it. Well, that's a really difficult lead to attribute without, uh, you know, just from pure marketing data. Um, right. So some of it is, it can just be, it can just be hard to track, but that's, right. a lot of that's changing. Um, and I think people are seeing that. Um, a lot of, we're, we're having a lot more, we're having a lot more starting conversations where people are starting with buy-in and marketing rather than needing to come around to that. So I'm pretty bullish on the change and that people people really are seeing the value of both. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, you mentioned HEMS and like I attended Vibe this spring, this past spring, and you know, many of our advisory board uh, members and team will be attending Health in October, yeah. um, experiencing similar live conference, you know, the, these types of ecosystems. And exhibitor booths are really impressive and they're super cool, but ultimately like it isn't necessarily a function of marketing at, at its finest. It's primarily in the sales you know, sector. And so I think um, we'd certainly see that in the hiring structure of executive teams. And we also see how teams are tracking RevOps in their CRMs, you know, talk to us about how, how should you be thinking about that, you know, from a CRM perspective and talk about some of maybe of the KPIs and understand the ROI of marketing strategies that can ensure that longevity and customer success, but also like 
attribute it properly? Like, is there a way to maybe explore yes. some of that? Yeah, yeah, we can talk about that. So, it um, what I our team's very goal oriented. So uh, the, the starting point is always kind of like, what is what is your goal? And from from what we see, it's typically it's typically one of three. Um, it's typically either general brand awareness, which in that case, what they're often saying is we're having tons of conversations already. You know, this is a great problem to have, but it's where they're having so many conversations already where they're really wanting the brand awareness to where when the prospects they have, when they're coming to them, talking to them, they already have a deep, more deep understanding of the organization, their offerings, what they're doing to where when they get there, it's truly a sales conversation um, because there's been a lot of education along the way. Another one that we're seeing a lot is recruitment. Um, a, a lot of companies, they're saying the issue is not bringing in new customers, it's, it's staffing shortages. Um, so what, especially on the provider side of things, um, that's where, you know, clinicians, nurses, doctors, um, there's a lot of, lot of shortages there as everyone is well aware. So uh, sometimes that's the primary goal. We've, we've had clients where recruiting is, is the key. Um, and the, the last one, which is, I'm gonna, is easily most common, is we want more leads. Uh, mm -hmm. MQLs, SQLs are always, um, always some of the key conversion points there. Um, but, but I, th I think it kind of in building out the KPIs, so it, it starts with what are you trying to do? So know which of those three, and it, it may be a little bit of all of them and, and that's mm -hmm. okay, but it's really mapping, taking those and saying, okay, if MQL is the key conversion point, what, um, what do you need to do? You know, where are those people traditionally coming from? I, I think. Mm -hmm. Underst looking at your current funnel is a great place to start. Um, you know, looking back is not always the best indicator of the future, but really understanding like where have your people come from so far? If you, you know, if you're creating content, is that content converting? Is that content leading to people engaging with you? Is it relevant to the topics that they're looking at? Um, a lot of that can help, and, and there's a lot of metrics to you know, time on page or uh, you know how many pages did they visit throughout your site. There's a lot of metrics that can help you understand some of these tactics, but it really is kind of like, what are you doing? Is it working? Is it not working? And then, then you can start to theorize why and build different KPIs around it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd like to dive a bit deeper into building a team equipped for marketing success. So, you know, you're kind of alluding to some of the KPIs that teams could be tracking. Um, for many enterprise teams, building a RevOps team is, for scale is key. So how would you, I guess, consult or, or share with a, with a team that's looking to scale their RevOps team? How much should you be allocating to sales versus marketing? Uh, what do those budgets look like? Yeah, great You've question. Seen, you have truly seen, it, like just for our audience, I, I think Peter has like the most visibility on the variety that we've been exposed to, uh, you know, at, at ratio. Yeah. It, it, it is a little bit of everything. And um, I, I will say I haven't, I haven't seen a clear pattern. So I, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give the like, oh, well, 40% should go towards this, 60% should yeah. go towards It really is dependent. It varies. Yeah. Yeah. It varies depending on the organization. I, I think from a starting point, sales and marketing have to be friends. Um, if it, it cannot be an adversarial relationship, it cannot be something. And we've, where we've seen companies fail is when it feels very adversarial. And that, that is, that is not what this is. Um, and I think as, uh, you know, as leaders, I think aligning compensation structure to align, to make it really be a group effort is, uh, is really important because I think if you're, if you're overly, I mean, compensation is a thing. So if yeah. you're, if you're tying people's compensation in a overly siloed way, where the, you know, the initial attribution is exclusively contributing to theirs, that's going, that's going to put these teams at odds and you're going to be starting from a, from a really poor standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I think some of it is like lean. So lean in when, when you have a founding team or an initial leadership team that you intend to stick around, be honest about what they're good at and what they're not good at and lean into those skills. So if you do have a strong sales team, when you say that, really dig into like, what are, what are they good at? <laughs> are they good at generating leads? Or are they good at closing leads or some combination of both? And then kind of build around what they're naturally good at. Not the thing that's really demotivating for them that they're doing because they know they have to, but what are, what are the really, what are the strengths and then build from there. I think on the, on the rev ops side, um, you know, how, you need a CRM and you need to be managing it well. Um, I think 
the, I'd say where some of the greatest tension in the marketing and sales, kind of those cross departments comes from, I would say is the, the lack of definition or the varying definitions between what a marketing qualified lead and what a sales qualified lead is. Yeah. And that's really, that's really the wrong focus. Like it's, it's like, it's sales saying like, oh, well, there's, they're not getting us en enough leads. And they're saying, marketing saying, oh, well, we, you know, you, we, we calculated it. You need a hundred leads in order to lead to, you know, to, to, to this number of sales and lead, uh, sales saying, well, this isn't good enough. Then it's like, you really need to work together and say, okay, well, what is good enough? Like in your mind and we, we have, you know, there, you can Google definition of SQL, defini definition of MQL. Ultimately, you need to define a definition within your organization and then be really consistent. Um, yeah. Because what you're doing is, you know, in your CRM, you're going to have leads, you, you know, there's going to be an origin date, you're going to at some point convert them into a deal. And then they're going to have, you're going to go through the funnel and see kind of at, um, at what rate did they convert and over what period of time. And it kind of doesn't matter <laughs> what those stages are. Um, as long as you're really consistent and everyone on the team understands them, because all you're really trying to do is you're trying to drive, you're trying to make the revenue as predictable as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so the pattern between the teams of knowing an MQL, knowing an SQL, and just working together with, uh, with what they are is, uh, is a really important piece to that. Yeah. I also love that you talked, you touched briefly on the, like the compensation side, because I think, you know, a lot of it is like, okay, we get it. Like compensation is very different for sales teams than marketing teams, but also customer success. So like customer success is just this often very overlooked like genre of community that, you know, they're, they're the ones that are, uh, that are, you know, retaining these clients, um, you know, year after year after year. And yet they're not necessarily, you know, while sales gets to maybe like go on a big, you know, hefty vacation, big you know, way. Oh, congratulations. You like made this many sales this year. And then like the customer success person is just like, <laughs> okay, I got like a day off. I don't know. You know, the, the structure is very different. So I don't know if you have any other further thoughts on that or like maybe how teams can structure that in a way that is rewarding for the holistic team and also understanding how marketing is kind of like that through line to helping to ensure that like, you know, structured and consistent communication is happening at every stage of the customer experience. But any other thoughts on that that you want to add? Yeah, um, I mean, it really, it really like, it comes down to aligning incentives. So yeah. I, I think, so uh, everything I've read about compensation is that ultimately it is, money is a demotivator, not a motivator. Um, but kind of, there's a, there's a floor to where that change, you know, below a certain point it will, but then in general, money is typically viewed as a demotivator. So in that you don't want to, you want to make sure that the compensation structure is built to where people have generally can control what they're doing or, um, or kind of like. I like to think about what what could go wrong. So mm -hmm. I think the higher, if, if it's a very, I'd say as a leader, you want a group culture. Like you want a culture that's working together, working collaboratively. So I think aligning that incentive. So something that might not be as effective in a cross team function is where it's strictly like, this is, this is your lead or this is marketing's lead. That's not mm -hmm. gonna be as effective as saying, hey, we need X number of dollars in net new revenue. So, you know, there is a, um, you know, a tiered bonus structure where if net new revenue, re, you know, if it's Y dollars, then you're going to see a Z percent bonus based upon that. That's one yeah. way to do it. I think it's the same with customer success, like, and you know, d different types of roles might have different structure. I think it's, I, I think you're right. I think I think someone in marketing or someone in customer success is likely to have a higher base where incentive pay is a little more incentive bonus, whereas sales might be more likely to have a lower base with a higher upside. And yeah. I don't I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think you just need to make sure that the metrics that's driving that is collaborative and not isolated by default. Well said. Yeah, well said. Um what else do we need to talk about? We have, we could, we could be here for a while. There's so <laughs> much. Notice. We, we could be talking about this stuff for a while. I would say, um, questions on 90 day plan for a marketing executive. 
Um, so like, you know, first 90 days, what would you, what, what are your recommendations, steps one, two, and three for a marketing executive? Yeah. So I'm going to ping pong between marketing executive personas. So, um, I'd say the first thing I would do is, I mean, come in and just audit the landscape. Um, and that's a, that's a big audit. So I, I would say, look, you know, what is the website? What is the messaging platform? What are the, what are the core offerings? So I, I would start the first thing like, okay, what are our core offerings? What can people buy from us and what does it cost? Like I just go that granular, what are the add-ons from there? Kind of, um, I would personally go through the onboarding journey, like if, or, um, kind of start from demo, like try to go through the sales process as far as I yeah. can to just. Because a marketing executive coming in, you have objectivity. You're going to lose that. And it's something really valuable that you have that other people in your org don't yet have or no longer have. So I would take advantage of that. So understand the products, understand how it's being articulated. And in an ideal world, it's it's articulated pretty well and you don't need to make major changes, but you, <laughs> you, you need to know the message. Um, yeah. on, on the other side, on the kind of rev ops side is, I would do. I would similarly do an internal deep dive of the funnel. So I would say what it, uh, specifically the CRM. So what CRM are we using? Where? What happens? Like how do contacts make their way in the CRM? So mm-hmm. generally speaking, you're going to have contacts, you're going to have companies, and you're going to have deals. Um, and it's understanding where. How are those people getting here? Is it through web forms? Is it manual entry? And what are we doing? Like, how are, are we marking things as a lead? Are we marking them as an MQL? When does it become a deal? Is that system consistent? And right. say, if it's if it's not consistent, which I, I will say, I'm making this number up, but 80% of the time, it sounds like it is not. Um, I had a, had a meeting yesterday with um, two marketing leaders within a health system and kind of pretty quickly, they started on there like, yeah, our CRM could use some work. And, uh, and that's, that's incredibly common and yeah. it's, you know, these teams are growing, these teams are evolving, but as much as you can, I'd say audit that CRM, see what's working because otherwise what's likely happening is you need to understand where you're not, where you're not being successful. Are you, are you not generating enough leads or are the leads not quality or are you bad at closing? Is closing yeah. the problem where you're getting enough leads, but that piece is just not happening. You really want to isolate the funnel to understand where where are you doing a great job and where are you not doing as well. Well, and also just chatting with customers about their entire experience. I feel like this is something that's so overlooked that we see a lot of like companies just not having a clear view of their client experience. Um, and you can only do that if you're actually interfacing with that human. So it's pretty important. That's important too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. And you, you can get a, like customers are going to give you a really clear sense of what they value. So, yeah. and if people, so, I mean, if depending, if the org is comfortable with it, I mean, just calling some of these customers and just kind of saying like, what, what attracted to us initially, what problem were you seeking to solve? How do you um, maybe be cautious on this one, but how well are we solving that? Like just asking these, um, some questions that can be really helpful is kind of trying to get to like a success story. And then also like, a, a non-successful conversation. Um, yeah. So maybe some win-loss analysis, because what ends up happening is if you won the business and ask them why, that's going to prioritize what they value. If you didn't get the business and ask them why, that's also going to show you what they actually valued when they were trying to solve their problem. So yeah. it can be um, it can be frustrating because if, if you don't get a deal and you go talk to them and they tell you the reason why, a lot of the time you're going to say, well, shoot, we, we have that feature or we do that. It just... You just didn't see it, and just um, I, I'm a big I'm a big believer that if someone doesn't buy something from us, it was our fault, kind of regardless. Yeah. Um, so if that's the case, then it's just like, well, we didn't do a good enough job articulating that we offer that feature, and now I know. And you, you don't want to get too caught up in recency bias, talking to one prospect and then going and changing your whole messaging platform. No but, doubt, yeah. But talk to some of these people and look for patterns. Yeah, yeah. Um, share a time when you've heard a client wanting to implement an MQL KPI for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah. We kind of sort of touched on this already, but sure. if there's anything that comes to mind. Yeah, I would say, um, I'd say it's twofold and this happens a lot. It, it's almost always an incorrect definition of what MQL is, or the other would be, um, I, I've seen a lot where people are expecting too much of an MQL. 
So j- broadly speaking, an MQL is a marketing qualified lead. It is somebody that has shown some type of int- some type of interest in your product. So mm-hmm. that could be they signed up for your newsletter. That could be that they saw you published a white paper and they downloaded that white paper. So you got their information and they became an MQL. And that's great. I think what I have seen is I've seen I've seen sales teams say, well, I, I called them and they're not ready to buy. So like that wasn't a good lead. And it's like that's that's not a fair expectation of the MQL. This person right. came, they were likely at the awareness phase of their problem. Uh, if, you know, look at, look at the lead source. Where did they come from? What, how did they make it into your CRM? But we, we have seen a lot where, and it's, it's very understandable. It's especially when sales are slow. Um, it's when, when business is slow and sales teams are under a lot of pressure to close deals and they only have so much to work with, then they're, they're doing what I would do, which is to go into our CRM and look at what is there and try to make the most of it. Um, but you need to know that when you're at that point, if you're going to someone that two days ago downloaded a white paper for the first time, and you see that traditionally your sales cycle is four months long, or it takes two months to go from an MQL to an SQL, you're rushing the process. It's just right. outside of getting lucky, your, your expectation is unrealistic. And it can have the opposite effect of coming on too strong. Uh, it could be yeah. someone that's really not ready to have a conversation, still hasn't fully understood their own problem. They're really in the early stages of education and calling them or trying to schedule a demo sometimes can just be really early. And yeah. just to be clear, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, I think if you need to reach out, but it's kind of a, a soft like, hey, I saw you downloaded this. If you're interested in a demo, we'd love to have a conversation. And if they don't respond, back off, keep, let them stay in your, in your funnel and continue to let the nurturing process happen over time. Yeah. Um, okay. So going to resources, um, tell us your favorite tools for mapping KPIs. I think we might have one. Oh, for mapping KPIs. How would I know? So I, I, there's a couple, um, I will say for something that we use with clients, that's very helpful. So this is like when you're running a marketing program is we, um, we use Google looker studio for a lot of our analytics. And we, we've built a lot of custom dashboards, but part of why we do that is because it can very easily and automatically connect into a lot of the marketing channels that we're already using. So it can plug into GA4, Google Analytics, um, and it can almost always plug into your CRM where you can tie it to number of new contacts, number of MQLs, number of contacts marked as an SQL. Um, and in some cases you can actually like pull in link, you can actually pull in the visuals of the LinkedIn ads. So it, it ends up being a really power, powerful tool that can be really, really automated. Um, if, if you are wanting tools to help you understand what you could spend in marketing, um, and still see the ROI, I'm going to do a shameless plug and, uh, point to our website. So we, um, we recently launched what we call our, our marketing spend ROI calculator. Uh, it's at goratio.com slash ROI dash calculator. And really the intent of it was, so it, it was, it came, it happened very organically. We, um, we were working with a prospect, um, that was, uh, well-funded and was very, very reasonably coming and saying, okay, we're trying to define our marketing budget. This is, this is new for us. So they were a series B company, but had never really chased after marketing and now have enough customers and significant funding to, to really do it right for the first time. So they didn't have a great framework of like, well, what's reasonable. So we kind of backed into that. We helped them back into it and said, okay, well, let's, let's talk about it a little bit. So, um, I think, I think the best way to do it is really to isolate and say, what can I spend to land one client and still meet my target ROI? So we, we built a calendar that, or a calculator that does just that. And it's really looking at it, and I'm, I'm not gonna recite the whole calculator, but it's, it's saying, you know, what is your average customer in a year? In a year? What's, what amount of revenue does it represent in a year? Then a big question that people don't often consider in, from a marketing standpoint is, how many years is that customer gonna be with you? So if it's 200,000 a year, they're gonna be with you for three years. Well, your lifetime value is $600,000. So if marketing has the potential to generate that, that's, that can kind of help you, help you better understand what you can spend. Yeah. Um, I think the key question in that is knowing what ROI you need um, in, order, yeah. in order to do this. 
So I think, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to give a whole lot of percentages, but with that, you know, if your marketing spend is 10% of your overall budget, and if marketing is expected to, to bring in all of the revenue, well, right there to break even, you're going to need a 10 X return. So yeah. some of this is, this is where you can work with your CFO to really understand. Um, and just kind of, I think the whole goal in this is trying to like, Marketing is a, marketing metrics are about simplifying the numbers so you can start to understand it. So that's really what the calculator is meant to do is what can I spend in marketing? Well, what ROI do you need? What's your customer worth? You can spend X amount in order to generate one customer. Then you can look at, okay, well, we close one in four deals. So we need four deals. And then we close one in four, uh, MQLs to SQLs, so we need 16 SQLs to land one customer. Now you're having really tangible conversations like, okay, will our marketing program support, will it lead to 16 MQLs? And that's a much easier conversation than just saying, how much money can we spend in marketing? Yeah. Like that's just a really <laughs> overwhelming question. <laughs> if not broken down that way. So yeah. yeah, no, super, super great resource. Definitely our listeners should check it out. Um, and I guess to follow up, are any podcasts, books, resources that you would recommend for people as they're evaluating just rev op, RevOps in general, marketing strategy, marketing ROI? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big spreadsheet person, so I, I think, uh, I don't know, this is a really bad answer, but I think just like tr lean on some basic math when you're doing some of these things and spreadsheets can be really helpful. Um, you know, I will chat GPT is a nice plug. It's a good, I, I am still using it as a brainstorming tool, but I, I think as a marketer, um, as you're asking yourself some of these questions, it can be really helpful to be like, and you're, you're not going to get some of the answers you want. Like how much can I spend in marketing or what percent of revenue do companies usually spend? It's, you're not going to get really accurate answers there, but you can start, you could plug in some of your own situation. Like I am a company that has this much in revenue this much is coming from existing sales. We need an extra 1 million from sales and 500,000 from marketing. What, like, I don't know exactly where I'm going with that, but, yeah, uh, but you can- Yeah, theoreticals, right? Yeah, like, you, you can text them in and just see where it goes. Um, but yeah. yeah, I don't have, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the content I consume tends to be a little more on the, the finance economic side of things, but- which, which is why you're on our team. We're, we're a very well-balanced team in that yes. regard. <laughs> so that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for joining us on the show. It's been a pleasure. And I know this is like a wealth of information for people as they're strategizing some of their RevOps plans. Um, we'll definitely have to have you back on the show to talk more in depth on a, on a couple of topics that we hit. So until next time, we'll, we'll see you guys at GoRatio.com.